metaphysics is a very curious term and not really well received. It hasn't been well received by philosophers themselves for a long time. In recent decades, things have improved in the understanding of metaphysics. But still, there's a prevailing impression that if you're doing metaphysics, you're doing something weird, something crazy, out of touch, trivial, even nonsensical. And yet, everybody's doing it. Or at least they're entering into the metaphysical problematic. I'll explain this a bit with a, an anecdote. Uh, when I was in college, there was a mathematics professor who was actually a good teacher, an intelligent guy, no doubt. Um, and I asked him once to explain to me the difference between real and imaginary numbers. So the square root of negative one is an imaginary number, whereas the square root of one, or just one, is a real number. So he proceeded to give me some explanation with number lines perpendic perpendicular to each other, zero in the center. But he started out by saying, I need to banish from my mind completely that the imaginary numbers do not exist. They exist just as much as the real numbers do. And in saying that, he entered into metaphysics. Well, if you observe what a lot of people say, a lot of, a lot of very intelligent people, uh, a lot of scientists, professionals, uh, they really enter into metaphysics as if it's obvious, uh, just like the mathematics professor. So you, you listen to a lot of these uh, popular risers of science, and they're doing metaphysics. They keep entering into metaphysics. They keep telling us what is. And that is actually how I'm understanding metaphysics here. It is the concern with what is. There are alternative uh, uh, definitions, but I think this is the best preliminary definition. You can't give a really, uh, really precise definition of a discipline until it's fulfilled until it's accomplished, or at least well on its way. Uh, I don't think we're nearly there with metaphysics, mainly because its history has been grotesquely interrupted time and again. Uh, certainly in the, in the uh, 20th century, it was, but maybe in this century, one of the great achievements can be that we put metaphysics back on the path to actualization. And I think that these three phenomenologists that I am considering here uh, can be helpful in that degree. So let me start with Brentano. Brentano is known for
for introducing intentionality into the contemporary uh, discussion, contemporary philosophical discussion, perhaps beyond philosophy, uh, if there is any such thing. Uh, but uh, we should look at that a little more closely. Uh, I will not quote the passage from his psychology from an empirical standpoint. You can see that all over. It could be one of the most cited passages uh, in, in philosophy where he states in the work I just cited, where he states that what is peculiar to a mental phenomenon is the intentional relation to an object. So that if I am if I'm perceiving or, or just imagining, I'm perceiving something, I'm an imagining something, and therefore perception is a case of intentionality. Or if I'm judging, I'm judging that something is the case, that something exists, that it does not exist, it's related to an object, intentionally re related to an object. The same with emotions. If I hate or if I love, I hate something. I, I love something. So uh, Brentano works with this notion of intentionality in the work that I've cited, psychology from an empirical standpoint, and he uses it to uh, classify the mental phenomena as opposed to the physical phenomena. A physical phenomenon, he says, is a color or a sound. He gives some other uh, examples, or at least another one initially, but colors and sounds are good enough. Uh, a color is not intentionally related to an object. Seeing a color is intentionally related to the color. Uh, now, he uses this, this concept of intentionality to classify the mental phenomena, as I said, and he puts them into three classes, which we won't uh, consider here in any detail because there's just, uh, there's really not enough time. There's a lot of literature about it. Uh, you, can, you can go and read that for yourself. Important here is his distinction between a, a science which describes consciousness as intentionality. So the mental phenomena, they all are instances of consciousness. And we can describe them without explaining them. So when he classifies them, for example, he is merely describing them. He's not explaining them. There were other uh, scientists at the time. Wilhelm Wundt springs to mind. He was he established a psychological laboratory in his terms. Actually, uh, a he was doing uh, a physiological psychology, and he was attempting to explain mental phenomena, at least on the sensory level. And, and of course, you get that, you get a lot of that in the, in, in the 19th century, and you still actually get a lot of it. But for Brentano, you have to describe what you're explaining. The initial task uh, in dealing with consciousness is to describe. 
So, you know, you take, uh, take seeing a color, for example. Well, you know, that's a, that's a, uh, a sensory perception. And you can say that it, it is actually caused by uh, light waves entering into the, into the eye through the pupil, striking the retina, etc. That's all explanatory, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with explaining mental phenomena. Yet we have to first acknowledge that there is a mental phenomenon uh, that is there to be described. So when we say that seeing a color is a perception, we've classified it, and that's a, that's already a certain level of description. There's a lot more to be said about it, but that should suffice for the present purpose. Now, uh, Brentano was actually concerned with, very much concerned with metaphysics. Uh, perhaps more than with this, uh, with phenomenology. But his metaphysics was very much uh, derived from his phenomenology. Uh, here we are focusing on his, uh, his, his late metaphysics, actually. The metaphysics that he developed in the uh, 21st century uh, which has come to be known as reism. Reism from the Latin res, uh, meaning thing. Uh, this is not, reism is not the, the a word that he used for his uh, position, but it's, it's commonly used. Um, and this is the view that when we are conscious of an object, we can only be conscious of a, of a real object, or in his terms, a thing. So, of course, we're, we'll primarily think of physical things. Men, uh, we'll think of physical things and mental things are a little odd to to a lot of people uh, but he definitely thinks that there's a mental thing uh, the mental thing can think of a of a mental thing or it can also think of a physical thing a corporeal thing in his in uh, his terminology um, so here we have two types of things and he wants to he wants to uh, reject the notion that we can think of something else besides a thing that there are actually non things uh, that we can think of and a, a, an a, an extent an outstanding example of a non thing in his terminology would be a state of affairs, a proposition, we could also call it a fact. These are uh, allegedly objects which can be uh, named by using that clauses. So we could say, for example, that I am thinking, that I am thinking. Names, according to some philosophers, names an object which is not identical with thinking itself. It names a state of affairs, a proposition, a fact. And uh, according to some ontologists, some metaphysicians, I should actually say, we can talk about ontology and metaphysics later, but I think metaphysics is actually the better term to be used here. 
we can, uh, so according to some, uh, the, the, the world, in a very broad sense of the world, uh, contains these, these non-things. Well, Brentano thinks that you can, you can, when you're dealing with a name such as a that clause, so any kind of name or nominal phrase, which apparently refer, refers to an object, he thinks you can, you can rephrase, you can paraphrase uh, the statement to make it a statement about a thing. It's a very simple example that we're using here, that I am thinking. Well, you can say that I am thinking is, a, is true, is a fact, is the case. But note that you're always, you're, you're not simply saying that I am thinking exists or that I am thinking is, it always cries out for is the case, is true, is a fact, something like that. And uh, Brentano says in, in this particular instance, this or this type of case, it's quite simple. I mean, when you say that I am thinking is the case, you're saying I am thinking. So the only, the only entity, the only, the only object, and really strictly speaking, an entity that is, that is named here in the strict and proper sense is the thing that is thinking. And he goes on down the line with various uh, non-things such as universals, phenomenal entities, and so forth. And he, and he maintains that you, you can always apply this kind of paraphrasing. Well, so that's, uh, that's Brentano's mature metaphysics as we are here uh, defining metaphysics, at least in a preliminary way, which I think is the most fruitful way to begin, especially in connection with phenomenology. Uh, now, Brentano thinks that this, this reism is actually based on uh, the, uh, is based on intentionality. So, uh, we are conscious of something where we are thinking in a broad sense of thinking uh, of something. Well, here we have a, we have a complex expression. I am conscious of something. I am thinking of something. And it's a, it's a, it's a semantic unity in itself. According to him, if you, if you, if you, change an element of this semantic unity you 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 change the whole meaning of it so if you if you allow for something to refer to a non thing such as one of these states of affairs propositions uh, facts you've changed the meaning of thinking uh, i am thinking of a non thing is, a, is for Brentano either a meaningless expression or it's, a, it, it's just another way of think, saying that you're not thinking. So there we have Brentano's very, very broadly and roughly stated Brentano's mature metaphysics. Now let's look at Husserl. Uh, Husserl, as we know, was a student of Brentano. And he learned this phenomenology from Brentano and got very much involved with it. Uh, his first book was actually uh, a philosophy of mathem 
of arithmetic, which is an attempt to uh, describe uh, describe uh, what we're doing in arithmetic using Brentano's descriptive tools, using Brentano's phenomenological tools. Uh, so first and foremost, intentionality. But he got very much involved with logic. He, cor he corresponded with uh, Gottlob Frege. Frege actually quite severely uh, criticized Husserl's early attempt to deal with philosophy of, of arithmetic. Um, and that could have that could have uh, given Husserl a kind of stimulus to to change things a bit in the way he's he's working with uh, arithmetic uh, philosophy of arithmetic philosophy of mathematics in general but at the same time he very much came under the influence of of a almost forgotten now we're remembering him somewhat uh, a philosopher and logician bernard bolzano and this took him down a path uh, where he actually was very much engaged with uh, with uh, developments of logic in the in the uh, in the late 19th century so it was unusual for for someone at the, for a philosopher at that time to be aware of Frege's work uh, who so was he was also very much uh, aware of what Charles Sanders Peirce was doing in logic and, and what Ernst Schroeder, uh, partly taken, taking his, uh, his logic from, from Peirce, this uh, algebra of logic. And uh, Husserl uh, proceeded to develop a notion of a, of a pure logic in the first volume of his logical investigations, but that was followed by a second volume, which was to be the properly phenomenological volume. And there he still, he, he, he's, he's working with the Brentanian concept of, uh, of phenomenology as a, a description of consciousness as intentionality. But what he, he develops there is actually, um, at least in part, a metaphysical view, namely the view that there are ideal objects in addition to real objects. So this is this is completely opposed to Brentano's mature metaphysics. These states of affairs, propositions, uh, facts are actually totally okay for for Husserl. And they get classified as ideal objects. Husserl says that the ideal objects is, exist. So in this respect, he's comparable to that mathematics teacher. Uh, he crosses the line from pure logic and, and phenomenology into metaphysics. Now there are certain people who think that I'm interpreting, I'm, I'm misinterpreting Husserl on this point, but I can defend that. It's, it'll take us very far afield right now if I go into it, um, but I can later on if somebody wishes. Uh, now, of course, Brentano, uh, 
was not pleased with this view. He was aware of what Husserl was doing because uh, Husserl was having a great impact on on young philosophers in Munich. Brentano had a brother, Luyo Brentano, uh, who was a professor of economics in Munich, and he uh, Brentano was well attuned to what was going on academically in in Munich. Uh, they corresponded, Brentano and Husserl corresponded about this issue, uh, and Husserl actually came to visit Brentano uh, in Florence. Brentano, after he, he resigned from his post in Vienna, his academic post in Vienna, uh, moved to, uh, after a few years, he moved to uh, Florence, and uh, they uh, they discussed primarily this this whole matter about uh, ideal objects, and they came they came to no agreement. Uh, but Brentano was not he did not really have any awareness of what Brent, of what Husserl was doing after that, or actually already at that time when he visited Brentano in, in Florence, he was developing this notion of a phenomenological reduction, of a pure consciousness, and this this was uh, this became Husserl's thing, uh, as as he continued to develop his views in the 20th century. Uh, so he, he wants to say in this, in this later view that consciousness is actually not part of the world. When you bracket the world, you come to see that there is an absolute constituting consciousness. Um, when he speaks of constitution, he does not he does not really define it, but he thinks it will become clear th through his uh, constitutive investigations and lead to this insight uh, that the absolute consciousness constitutes the world. Um, now, I think that uh, Husserl not only crosses the line here into metaphysics, but he crosses the line into a very problematic metaphysics. Uh, he, the basis, the basic Thing. It, it is based on his view of intentionality, okay? Uh, he does think that, that, uh, that intentionality is really, is actually this constitution. And you really have to have this notion of an absolute or a pure consciousness that constitutes the world, things, etc. I think his fundamental uh, error in adopting this view is uh, that he he shifts from a, a kind of Cartesian insight that I am, I think, therefore I am, which is uh, it's it has its uh, its epistemological merit. I don't, I don't doubt that. But it, it really requires that you, you come for Husserl, that you come to the view that there is this absolute constituting consciousness. So this is this is uh, Husserl's mature metaphysics. Uh, I'm, I know I'll receive objections from uh, dogmatic or maybe not so dogmatic uh, uh, Husserlians, but 
there it is. And now let's finally move on to the third phenomenologist here, Alexius Meinong, uh, also a, a pupil of uh, Brentano, a pupil of Brentano before uh, before Husserl was, who did a lot of a lot of description of consciousness as intentionality, but he does not use the term intentionality, and he he never calls himself a, a phenomenology, a phenomenologist. But what's in a name? Uh, there are. There are people who use these such terms in, in, in great frequency, but I don't really think that they, they're phenomenologists. I think that it is not at all wrong to call Meinong a phenomenologist, but that's not what he's known for. He's known mainly for his jungle. Meinong's jungle. Uh, what is Meinong's jungle? Uh, it is like the the very antithesis of Brentano's realism. So for Meinong, there are all kinds of non-things. There are states of affairs, propositions, facts. He likes to use the term objectives for this class of objects. There are um, incomplete objects like a, a triangle without, we can speak of a triangle without specifying whether it's a, a right triangle, an acute triangle, or an obtuse triangle. It's just a triangle. That's an incomplete object or say contradictory objects. A, a, a round square, it's an object, okay? It doesn't exist, but it is nevertheless an object uh, in, in my own's jungle. I think it's, uh, you know, there are, there are some philosophers, not many, who try to grope with the mind on this jungle, usually with logical tools, uh, try to couch it in, into a kind of semantics. And that I think is a, is a legitimate task, but I think there's an easier way into mind on metaphysics. And it is a metaphysics. I'll get, I'll explain that in, in a moment. Uh, in a work that he published in 1907 uh, on the on the place of object theory, so this is but object theory is what he calls uh, his description of this this jungle. Jungle is not his term, uh, but in this work of 1907 on the place of object theory in the system of sciences. He, he begins this discussion uh, with a, by thematizing homeless, he says, homeless objects, objects that the sciences have just neglected. Um, and his first example is, is extremely important here uh, because I think it's really a way into mine own, or if you don't take it as a way of, into Meinong, it, it at least uh, uh, gives you uh, an alternative uh, metaphysical view. Um, so the, the first class of homeless objects he mentions are objects of sensation, Empfindungsgegenstände. This is an unusual term at that time. Usually they would talk about contents of sensation. The, the, the notion of a sensation as an act that has an object was uh, uh, not very well received, certainly not well received by Husserl. Uh, so Husserl would rather speak of a, of a 
of a sensation, an object of a sensation, or a content of sensation, or sensation itself as a content. Uh, but according to my own, take this example of seeing a color, that is a full-fledged in, intentional act of consciousness. So the color in this example is an object. Now, as we know from, uh, from modern philosophy, from, from Galileo and Descartes and Locke, Newton, of course, that colors uh, do not belong to the physical world. There are, uh, uh, during Meinong's time, uh, this, this was still very well received, uh, a very well received view. So Brentano uh, uh, speaks of it with respect. So when we see, when we see red, for example, and I mean an instance of red, you actually see red. Uh, well, what is out there in the world is actually not, not really red. There are light waves out there that enter into the pupil, strike the retina with the result that we see red. But the color, no, red, the color, does not exist in the external world, nor does it exist in consciousness. I have in my consciousness, there is the act of seeing red, but not red. There is no red. There are no colors in my consciousness. So what is the color? Is it a physical object? No. Is it a mental object? No. It doesn't, it doesn't actually belong to the world. In Meinung's term, terms, it is also zayant. It is outside of being. Now this, uh, this uh, creates, I mean, if we, if we don't go farther into uh, uh, Meinong's jungle, this already creates a, a, a problem in, in metaphysics. Uh, outside of being, so metaphysics is concerned with being, being as such, uh, being in various senses. It could be could be a real being, could be ideal being, but the color is it's it's not it's not mental, it's not physical, it's actually not not ideal. We literally see a color. Uh, so here he has objects outside of being, and uh, this these are to be uh, fully uh, fully investigated in his object theory. So he actually confronts the question of where does this leave metaphysics, and he comes to the conclusion that well. Object theory is actually, it's, object theory is broader than metaphysics because object theory uh, treats objects in general, a notion that Husserl also had, by the way, um, including these objects uh, that lie outside of being. Uh, so, he still thinks, well, metaphysics, it, 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 uh, it's really just limited to, to real being. This is a notion that comes up in Husserl as well. And I think in Husserl, before mine own, uh, mine own and Husserl always had, always they, for a while they had this dispute, who said it first? We don't much care about that. Uh, but Husserl definitely doesn't have, he, he definitely doesn't have this notion of uh, 
objects of sensation as objects that lie out, outside of being. He comes close, but not quite. Okay, so metaphysics uh, for Meinong is actually a, a, a science of the real. Object theory is, a, is, is the science of objects in, in general. But this is very hard to digest because metaphysics is traditionally uh, conceived of as the, as the broadest discipline imaginable. Uh, but we're not here fixated on, on tradition. Uh, you can explain farther how this is uh, further how this is uh, this view of Meinong is problematic. Uh, you still, when you're talking about these objects of, of sensation, they nonetheless have a they don't have being simpliciter, but they have a being thus. So the color. Uh, the the red that I see is is different from the blue that I see. Um, the the orange that I see is more like the the red that I see than it is like the blue that I see. And uh, Meinong does deal with this uh, this matter. He 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 states a, a so called principle of independence where. The being thus of an object is independent of its being, its being simpliciter. But this is all about being. <laughs> and saying there, there's an, uh, uh, there are objects outside of being, you're talking, of, you're making a statement about being, actually. So it really is and should be metaphysics in the sense that I'm talking about it here. So these are the, uh, I've stated the, uh, the three uh, metaphysical uh, views in this, uh, this triad of phenomenology. And uh, I now want to make a, some concluding remarks. Here I have actually followed a kind of Aristotelian path uh, in the sense that I've uh, I've tried to lay out a a, a kind of history uh, uh, of various metaphysical positions, and I would I I like to see that as a way of setting up for further discussion. Uh, it's a, it's a kind of dialectical or operatic uh, discussion. It, it gives you a uh, it gives you some sense of the problems of metaphysics uh, in a historical way, very much like uh, Aristotle's uh, book Alpha of the Metaphysics. And in Book Alpha, Brent, uh, Aristotle actually, he says that what he, he can draw from this historical discussion, that there are three, there are four, four, four ways of, of knowing why something is the case or famously known as his four causes. And uh, I want to state here four intentionalities which I think uh, can be further elaborated on in the development of a properly phenomenological intentionality-based metaphysics. First, there's the consciousness of the real from Brentano. There are a lot of problems that can be, uh, can be elaborated on by using this notion. Secondly, there's the consciousness of the ideal from Husserl's logical investigations. Uh, that, uh, of course, can be uh, further investigated. Uh, 
thirdly, even if we even if we reject uh, uh, Husserl's notion of uh, of an absolute constituting consciousness, we still I think we can still retain his notion of uh, of constitution. And one of the most interesting uh, views that Husserl reaches uh, in his final work is is this uh, this notion of the constitution of science through the life world, through the everyday world that we experience. I think this this uh, a lot of uh, metaphysical problems can be. Uh, it can be stated, perhaps solved uh, by developing this notion farther. And fourthly, there's there is the fourth intentionality is consciousness of what lies outside of being, so for minor. And here we, of course, we have the objects of sensation. Uh, Meinong also comes to the conclusion that the universals are, are actually outside of being. And, and this is where we could uh, talk about universals and metaphysics. But Husserl also thinks that there are, that universals are ideal objects. So this this could very well be a problem that we we can reflect on in developing a properly phenomenological uh, metaphysics. But these problems, uh, to my mind, would have to be all further elaborated on and systematically developed in a kind of book beta. Uh, for so. Uh, Aristotle, in his metaphysics, uh, el systematically elaborates on the problems of metaphysics, all, re all revolving around this notion of the four causes um, or principles. Uh, principle and cause are practically synonymous uh, for Aristotle. So I suggest here that you have these four intentionalities, which are to be uh, to be the springboard for a kind of book beta on uh, phenomenological metaphysics. Thank you for listening to me.